right, another round of applause for Federico from Avmos. All right, next up, interchain security. What do I know about it? Not a lot. I can't really speak on, on it a whole lot. But I know someone who can. It, next up on stage, the Cosmos Hub lead at the Interchain Foundation, Billy Arenacamp. Hi, everyone. Thanks for having me. I'm Billy. Um, just want to give a quick round of applause to the organizers here. This is amazing to have a community-focused conference. It's like fantastic. It takes so much weight off of my shoulders. Uh, just <laughs> real quick round of applause. Great job, everybody. Thank you. So who am I? I'm Billy. Um, my handle is OK with me. Find me on GitHub and all the places. I'm from Louisville, Kentucky, so if you like bluegrass music or thoroughbred racehorses or bourbon whiskey, please come talk to me later. Um, the Cosmos Hub lead at the ICF. Previously, I was actually at Tendermint Inc. I was on the Looney team, which was the first wallet. I uh, worked as a developer relations engineer there. Before that, I was in the East space doing a lot of work around bonding curves, NFTs, full stack web development, uh, and actually have a background in art. Independent of that, I'm the founder of Clover's Network, which is a generative uh, NFT project, and Folia App, which is an NFT gallery. And as a side, I love hackathons. So if anybody's interested, look out for the Cosmos Hack Adam that's currently taking place. So interchain security, let's give you an overview to begin with. Uh, we're going to talk about the basic mechanics. There's a security provider chain, security consumer chain, the risks and rewards, and then we're going to talk about the milestones, the V1 milestone, full set security provider, V2 milestone, partial set security provider, and V3 milestone, which we call layered security. So there's a lot of terms that have been used around layered secu or interchain security in the past, uh, interchain staking, let's just keep it simple, interchain security for now, uh, and the basic mechanics. Uh, we change names a lot. Uh, Previously, we used the term parent chain and child chain, but we didn't want child chains to feel diminutive. So we're using uh, security provider and security consumer. So please forgive me if I accidentally say parent or child chain at some point. Provider, consumer. The security provider chain actually has a standard staking module that keeps track of the validators and the voting power. So this is how all Cosmos SDK chains currently work. They have staking modules that do this job. Uh, they take that set of validators and their voting power, which is you know, the composition of the staking token that has been delegated to those validators, and they hand it up to Tendermint over ABCI. Tendermint then takes that, and they allow those different node operators to produce blocks. Now, the difference on a security provider chain with interchain security is that they also have a new IBC module called cross-chain validation module. This is being built by the IBC team at Interchain Foundation, uh, and this module will take that same set of validators and voting power, which was originally sent up to Tendermint for block production, and it puts it inside of an outgoing IBC packet. And this IBC packet gets relayed to the consumer chain, which brings me to the consumer chain. So the consumer chain does not have a traditional staking module. Instead, it has a registry that it keeps records of all of the validators and voting powers from the provider chain and keeps those locally then it hands those off to its own set of validators, which you know, are identified through this, this, uh, this registry. Um, so it keeps track of them with that incoming CCV IBC packet, uh, and then provides that, that information for block production. Uh, now, what are the risks and rewards involved in here? So starting with the security provider chain, they are risking their staking token. So the Cosmos Hub, as a security provider, it is the Cosmos Hub validators which are risking their atoms. Uh, the consumer chain, the one who's received that set of validators over CCV, they can also send back another IBC packet that will slash those atoms on the security provider chain. So it's the uh, consumer chain which can say, hey, uh, your validators, our validators, are, are acting up. And the two things that they, they are typically slashed for in Tendermint are downtime so if it's your turn to produce a block and you don't show up, you get slashed for that. Or double signing. So if you are supposed to produce a block and you actually sign two different blocks, that could be a signal that you're trying to fork the network and that's really easy to sort of prove because you take contents of both of those, prove it's the same block height, same signature, and you slash a validator for that. So uh, the provider chain is going to be getting slashed for the same you know, bad activity it would be getting slashed for when it's locally producing blocks, except for this happens remotely on the consumer chain. Um, and like I said, double signing is pretty easy to prove. Uh, but in general, the, the simplest configuration is just to trust the uh, consumer chain uh, that they want to slash the provider chain's validators because they did something bad. And 
like I said, it's easy to prove the double signing part. The downtime part's a little bit harder, so you basically just trust them. We have some ideas about how to make that verifiable. But an open question is how to be more generally verifiable on the slashing logic for the provider chain. So if your consumer chain has some really fancy logic that uh, encourages or discourages very specific behavior, it might have custom slashing conditions. For instance, the Gravity Bridge has custom slashing conditions. And you want to be able to offer that same slashing logic to the parent chain without having to just trust that, that consumer chain all the time about them being right about it. Now, when you're using a full validator set, it's not a bad trust assumption because you've got the same set of people on both sides. Um, but it is an open question how to make sure that uh, it can be completely verifiable on the parent chain so you're not trusting them all the time. We've got some ideas about how to do this, most likely around Cosmosm, where you'd sort of deploy your own verification logic on the provider chain, and then the consumer chain would execute that. Um, but if those are the kinds of questions that interest you, get a hold of me. We're hiring in this kind of department. Uh, I'm bringing us to the rewards. Uh, so we've got the consumer chain, uh, which is the one that's consuming these validators. That's the chain who's in charge of rewarding the provider chain for risking those atoms. You know, what are you going to do for me to make me produce blocks on your chain to risk my atoms? Um, and what's really exciting is that the, the uh, consumer chain actually can design that reward mechanism however they want. And I'll talk a bit more about that in a second. But once they have figured it out, you can imagine the most simple one is pretty standard that they just have every block, they produce some new token, and they pay it off to somebody else. Well, luckily, we can just use the standard IBC token transfer packet to make this happen. So inside of the reward module, every single block, when they produce this batch of rewards, typically it would go to the local distribution module and get sent out to all the different validators. Instead of doing that locally, you put it into an IBC transfer packet, and you send it off to the provider chain. If the destination is the distribution module of that provider chain, it acts as if it was just normal fees that came in during that block on the provider chain and just gets distributed perfectly the way it would normally. Um, there is some open questions about the fidelity between the epochs of both chains. And what I mean by that is if you were to produce a block on the uh, consumer chain, uh, you would want to reward the validator set on the provider chain. However, there's some asynchronicity between that. So you've got the provider chain producing blocks, and you've got the consumer chain producing blocks. The consumer chain sends the reward for this block production, but it doesn't get here until that next block is produced, which means that if you were to join that block as a validator, you get paid for producing one that you actually didn't participate in. And if you were to leave, you would not receive your final payment, which is not ideal, but it's also not terrible. It basically encourages validators to join the validator set and discourages validators from leaving the validator set. Uh, and it simplifies the whole system to do it this way, but it is an open question, you know, how can we make sure that that is a little bit better? It's not uh, the worst case scenario, and we're trying to uh, work through it as fast as possible, so I, I like this solution. And now for the V1 milestone. So this is the one I mentioned earlier, the full set security provider. This is the first thing we're working on because it's the simplest, and that just takes the entire validator set from the provider chain, puts it in that packet, hello? Puts it in that packet and sends it to that consumer chain. Uh, when you do this, you're going to have to have the entire validator set, which means you're going to want to do it through governance. So it would be a governance proposal that comes in, everyone votes on it, because everyone's affected by this. You know, all the validators are now going to be responsible for producing blocks on this new consumer chain. They're all going to be risking their atoms on it. They should all participate in the decision whether or not they want it to happen. I think it is actually mostly as a scaling solution, uh, especially for the Cosmos Hub, uh, one that I really like because it supports this idea of hub minimalism. So for scaling, we generally talk about vertical scaling, trying to shove as many transactions as possible into a single block. That's increasing the TPS. You see all these blockchains saying, we have the highest TPS, we have the highest TPS. This is vertical scaling. What I really love about this is that it allows for horizontal scaling. Horizontal scaling is essentially you've got one blockchain, and you really just push the limit. There's always going to be a theoretical maximum number of transactions per second you can get into a single block. And so instead of trying to continue to defy the laws of physics and push that even higher, you duplicate that blockchain. You've now just doubled the capacity of the transactions that can be sent to it because you have two new blockchains running. The problem with that, of course, is that when you have a new blockchain, you're going to have to have a new staking token. You have to build value for that. You have to secure that brand new blockchain. However, with a full set uh, security provider of interchain security, you're able to replicate the entire set of security from the original blockchain. And you've just doubled your capacity to transact new transactions. With IBC, of course, you're able to still interact between these two blockchains, so it's like it's still part of a shared state. Um, but you're able to scale horizontally that way. Um, the other aspect that's really nice is security. So if you have a single blockchain, you're adding more and more and more features, you're increasing the surface area of the attack for, for going down. 
So if you take each of these new modules, that each of them coming with their own new attack surface, and you put them into their own blockchain, secured by the same full validator set, and one of those blockchains has a bug, it doesn't bring down the entire system. So this is really nice for the Cosmos Hub, especially who's so security critical. You know, this is uh, the utmost importance of the Cosmos Hub. And so every time you add new code, there's this huge process of putting it on there because we don't want anything to go wrong. However, if each of those new modules were to be on their own blockchain, we could have a much faster development cycle because there's much you know, less risk of the whole system coming down. Uh, and that faster development cycle also points to this idea of sovereignty. So each of these consumer chains can actually have their own governance token. So you could imagine each module on a blockchain is governed by its own token because it might have very distinct needs from each other. Um, for instance, the Gravity Dex had its own token. It was on its own chain. It could have its own decisions about you know, when, how do we upgrade, what are the features. I've gotten feedback from validators before who say, you know, we're node operator infrastructures. We don't know anything about DeFi. Why should we be voting on these parameters that are related to this protocol that's it's not really our job? You know, that's not all of them, of course, but you'd be able to have you know, really specific governance related to each use of a blockchain. And that's really you know, at the bottom line of the thesis of Cosmos. Application-specific blockchains solve for scalability and sovereignty. Um, candidates for this, you know, is like I mentioned, uh, the DEX would potentially be able to move over to this uh, Gravity Bridge, uh, even potentially Cosmosm. You know, we've always pushed against having Cosmosm on the hub because it really opens up the attack surface. You know, there's just a generalized state machine really is unknown unknowns there. Uh, so we could even imagine having that still being fully secured by interchain security. V2 milestone, partial set security provider. So uh, partial set security provider means that there is a registry on the security provider chain in which validators actually opt in to risking their atoms and producing blocks on these consumer chains. Um, you probably want to have some sort of a configuration for that relationship so that you're not just getting, say, one validator who decides to opt in. you got this new blockchain. Your market cap is the equivalent of that one validator's total delegation. You know, you might be better off just launching your own token. So you can imagine some configuration about having some kind of a minimum voting power before it turns on. Um, but what we really like about this is that it encourages a diverse validator composition. So it means that you could have validators who have, you know, they're pretty low on the list of the, the uh, validator list, and they want to rise in that. They're willing to take on more risk than other validators are. And in exchange, they're earning more rewards. So they might be like, sure, we'll, we'll validate on every single chain that shows up because we want to be the most competitive validator possible. We've got a huge risk appetite. We want to grow. Uh, and that's how they can you know, compete in this, this world of validators where you've got maybe larger validators. Life is good. You know, there's no reason to take on this extra risk. We're going to be a conservative validator. It really encourages a diverse composition of validators across blockchains. And it also means you could potentially have validators that are outside of the top 150. Because we right now you know, have 150 validators in the Cosmos Hub, but there are other validators in that list. They're just not allowed to produce blocks. They currently have atoms staked. They're just waiting and wishing to join that top 150, but why not put those atoms to use? Why not encourage a much larger group of validators who use their atoms to secure blockchains and produce blocks, even if they're not producing it on the Cosmos Hub itself? Um, and I mentioned earlier, the thing I really like about this is kind of free market mechanics. So in Polkadot, you've got basically a one-size-fits-all. It's an auction for a slot to be able to participate in shared security. But this is completely configurable. You know, it might be a completely off-chain mechanism. It says, hey, I have these service agreements, these legal agreements, and I'll pay you in fiat through a bank on a monthly basis if you produce blocks on my blockchain. Anybody willing to do that? Validators can opt in. They register. They get paid out of band. You know, it can be completely configurable. It can be completely on-chain. You might be doing it for, for a reason besides tokens. You know, there can be really any aspect of it. And I think that's a really exciting design space to configure out what are the relationships between these provider chains and consumer chains that make it attractive for both parties. V3 milestone, layered security. So V3 milestone uh, could actually use either of the original two. The full set could come over CCV or a partial set could come over CCV. But the difference is that this uh, Consumer chain actually has its own validator set already because it has its own staking token. So this is the version of interchain security that is especially exciting for projects that already exist. They've already launched, they have their staking token, but they want to start securing their chain at a higher level of integrity because they're starting to have maybe more total value locked. It's starting to compete with their market value. You know, start really opening up an attractive attack vector for different people. Um, and so in this scenario, once that validator set comes over CCV, it gets combined with the validator set that's represented from the local staking token. Uh, it becomes the combination of them. So you take your local market cap, which is you know, a stand-in for how secure your blockchain is, and you add on top of it the market cap for the staking token that's coming in from the provider channel. 
This is a distribution of risk. You now have much better composition of, of who's producing under what conditions and, and what tokens do you have to buy to accumulate in order to attack this network. But you also have a distribution of rewards. It means that you're not just paying your local validators, not paying just your local delegators in some token. You're also taking some percentage of that and sending it up to this provider chain. It looks a lot more like insurance. You know, you're, you're hedging your own security using these different um, provider chains. You can even imagine combining this and having multiple provider chains at the same time or go full expanding brain mode and go both ways. So one chain might be consuming security from another chain and at the same time that chain is consuming security from the first chain. You've now basically mixed your staking token across these two blockchains and if you go full on like Sonny was talking earlier, I really see this vision of a giant sort of mesh net of shared risk, shared rewards all across the sort of internet of blockchains. Uh, and constantly changing, you know, these are, these are free market mechanics. They can be updated on short time periods, long time periods. It's really like a living organism of, of uh, uh, infrastructure. Um, and the other aspect that's kind of interesting here is this distinction of legal decentralization. You know, say you were to launch your blockchain and you really take the uh, iterative approach where you run your own validators, but it means that you can like, you know, ship features on a day-to-day -day basis because you're not bottlenecked by coordinating a lot of people. Uh, maybe you sold to just a handful of VCs, so you only have like a couple validators to begin with. I think there's a very viable path to that. But you want to be legally recognized as a decentralized network. If you start consuming the validator set from some justifiably decentralized network like the Cosmos Hub, I think you have a much better chance of, say, posing inside the eyes of the SEC. I mean, this is not legal advice. Please do your own research. Uh, but one of the aspects I think is underappreciated in interchain security. Candidates for layered security has been osmosis. Has talked a lot about this. They're excited for it. If you heard Sonny's talk earlier, you know his vision for interchain security really touches everybody in the ecosystem. Uh, and I think bridge chains are especially good for this because the security of their their total value locked is so important uh, to the operation of their networks. So you can imagine the Gravity Bridge or projects like Axla or Nomic. These are not endorsements, by the way. But if you see them, give them an elbow, send them my way. And that is interchain security. Um, I understand that we're running a little bit out of time. Uh, so if you have questions, come outside and talk to me. Thanks very much.